And with that, I believe we are live and on the internet on YouTube. All very exciting. Hello, everyone out there signing on uh, either live with us or sometime in the future, whenever you're watching this. Um, my name is John Lustria. I'm the education coordinator at the National Museum of Civil War Medicine, joined today by the incomparable Matt Borders and John Schultz uh, of the Frederick County Civil War Roundtable. You're in for a treat today. Uh, we're going to be talking about, um, talking about uh, uh, Lincoln's wartime travels uh, from Washington. So that should be um, a incredibly engaging program. Um, bear with me a moment, viewers. I'm gonna um, spread the link around so more people can join us. Um, I'll turn it over, Matt, if you wanna go ahead and get started. Um, sure, John. And, and I'll, I'll also note, and you can reiterate this, Matt, when you, when you talk, but if anyone has any questions at any point during the program, you can uh, put them in the chat and we'll get to them at the end of Sounds great. Thank you, John. And again, thank you to the National Museum of Civil War Medicine. This is, of course, the January meeting of the Frederick County Civil War Roundtable. We would not be able to have these meetings and have them run so smoothly without our partners there at Civil War Medicine. So thank you again very much, John, for you and everything you've done for us. Tonight, ladies and gentlemen, I am extremely pleased to welcome uh, a dear friend of mine, John Schilt, a true institution when it comes to the Maryland campaign. John has possibly forgotten more about the campaign than I will ever know. Uh, he has written 37 different works related to the American Civil War, and I suspect, uh, John, you've probably written a few more than just those 37 as well, but 37 specifically related to the war. And tonight he is going to be speaking on, as John said, Lincoln's wartime travels. And of course, we know Abraham Lincoln does visit both the South Mountain and Antietam battlefields, dips down there at Harper's Ferry as well. But John's going to be talking a little bit about the various travels of President Abraham Lincoln. So without further ado, I want to turn it over to our speaker this evening. Thank you again for being here with us, John. And this is going to be a great presentation, folks. Thank you, John. Thank you, Matt. And also uh, thanks to Chris Vincent, the chief guide at the battlefield, a gentleman who served his country over 25 years in the United States Army. And uh, if any of you folks have cabin fever and want to get out of Dodge, uh, call or Jacob Rohr back in in uh, Sharpsburg and you'll hear Chris's pleasant voice and uh, you'll have a wonderful weekend. So uh, uh, this talk, actually began many, many years ago. I grew up in Walkersville when it was a little town of 750 and knew everybody. All 12 grades at school were in one building. And on Lincoln's birthday in first grade, Miss Edith Nicodemus uh, brought in a miniature log cabin, a uh, piece of fence rail, and pictures of Lincoln uh, reading the Bible by the fire and an ax, they probably lock her up now. But at the close of the session, she gave each one of us uh, young uh, first graders uh, a penny. And believe it or not, after all these years, I still have the penny in my box of precious mementos, the penny that she gave me on uh, Lincoln's birthday in first grade. I won't tell you how long ago it was, but I still have it. Then many of you pro probably knew Ted Alexander, the longtime historian at Sharpsburg, uh, the Antietam battlefield. So one day, uh, uh, Ted asked me to give this talk. And when I was finished, why, uh, he said, well, why don't you turn this into a book? So uh, there's a great book, I don't remember the author, who wrote Journey to Greatness, Lincoln's Journey from Springfield to uh, DC. And then, of course, there's a book on a funeral train. And here and there, there are things about uh, uh, his travels, but we tried to get some of the nuts and bolts of, uh, of his travels. Now that the president sneezes, they write about it, but the press wasn't quite like that in 1862. 
but um, uh, Lincoln's trips weren't all that many. Um, actually, the middle Atlantic states, so to speak. One trip to New York, uh, to West Point, two trips to Pennsylvania, to Philadelphia, to the sanitary fair to raise money for the soldiers, then to Gettysburg, three trips to Maryland, sanitary fair, of course, Antietam, Point Lookout, and then uh, basically the rest of the trips were uh, to uh, uh, Virginia. Uh, now, how did he travel? Well, that's a simple question. Horse and carriage, horse and ambulance, uh, train or by ship, both small and large. Uh, those three main ways. And why did he travel? One, to confer with the generals, two, to plot strategy, three, to uh, visit with the troops, four, to raise money, and number five, I think, uh, to get out of the swamp. So uh, sit back and relax. And first, we'll go to West Point in uh, June of uh, around 1861. And why did he go there? To confer with the great man of the U.S. Army, Winfield Scott, veteran of the of, of War of 1812, but getting old and uh, maybe somewhat feeble. But Lincoln wanted to talk to him. And when he met him, he said, now there's nothing wrong. We're not planning anything. I just want to uh, seek your advice. So the first trip was to uh, West Point, uh, again by train uh, with brief stops in New York City and then uh, in Albany. So uh, we'll proceed in a moment from West Point. We're working on the communications. Uh, Mosby's working on the lines. It looks good on my end, guys, just uh, in case yeah, you're the, wondering. The, the PowerPoint's up. I'm not sure if you're on the slide you need to be on, but the, this, the okay. screen is sharing properly. OK, good. Okay, so um, that was to West Point. And then the uh, following spring, why uh, uh, Lincoln traveled, there we go, West Point, way back in 1860, a little different now. But in the spring of, eight, of 1862, uh, Lincoln journeyed to Fredericksburg, Virginia. Uh, most of his trips to Virginia, uh, he first went to the U.S. Navy Yard. And often there, uh, he met a distinguished gentleman, Admiral Dahlgren, the inventor of the Dahlgren uh, gun, uh, Dahlgren Hall, U.S. Naval Academy. His son was wounded in, uh, during the retreat from Gettysburg uh, in the streets of Hagerstown. And uh, he got to become fairly good friends with Admiral Dahlgren. And of course, then uh, all of the students of the Maryland campaign remember that um, uh, the Dahlgren's wife built the Dahlgren Chapel uh, and had like a Catholic school for the uh, nearby residents. So uh, uh, he left from the Navy Yard. Uh, Admiral Dahlgren was along with him and they traveled on a small boat called the USS Bat. And the uh, Lincoln uh, uh, stood on the deck when they passed Mount Vernon and reverently spoke of George Washington. So they went to Fredericksburg and then go to the next one to uh, Don Gibbon. Uh, of course, uh, Gibbon had been an artillery instructor at West Point. And uh, Lincoln, uh, when he met Gibbon, said, uh, uh, are you the man that wrote the decline and fall of the Roman Empire? And uh, Gibbon said, uh, no, but he said, I." I wrote uh, an artillery manual, but the government has not reprinted it. And Lincoln sp supposedly said, well, we'll have to see what we can do about that. Uh, Gibbon was also present at Gettysburg uh, 
recovering from wounds the, um, uh, the day of the Gettysburg Address. And of course, you know, Edward Everett became fairly long-winded and given an, another officer walked over to uh, uh, Cemetery Ridge where they had repulsed Pickett's charge, still got back to hear Lincoln's immortal speech. So uh, that was the meeting with Gibbon. From Fredericksburg, we go uh, uh, also to Virginia uh, in the midst of the seven days uh, or the Peninsula Campaign. And we go to Berkeley. That's the next one. There we are. Uh, quite a historic place. Berkeley, Harrison's Landing, very old, connected with the U.S. presidents. And there he conferred uh, with uh, McClellan. And uh, of course, uh, there at Berkeley, some say the first Thanksgiving took place, but that's neither here nor there. But also, one of the stories is that uh, um, the uh, uh, Daniel Butterfield introduced the bugle call taps at Berkeley. So uh, uh, there were one or two visits to Berkeley in the summer of 1862. Uh, during Lincoln's travels, he usually had sort of an upset stomach and he always blamed it on uh, the water, so uh, drinking water. So I don't know whether maybe it was a case of nerves or, or whatever. But uh, on one of the trips to uh, Berkeley, uh, somehow the boat got stuck on a sandbar and uh, they couldn't uh, get back out for a while. So the presidential party uh, hopped over the side and some of them rolled up their trousers and some took off their clothes and, and they got into the water in their underwear. So uh, that's one of the untold stories perhaps of the uh, Lincoln administration. So uh, spring of 1862 to Fredericksburg, Virginia to confer with McDowell, then the Peninsula Campaign in the summer of 62, the Berkeley Plantation. Then folks, it's time to uh, come home to Harpers Ferry, then still Virginia, to Sharpsburg, Maryland, and then to uh, uh, the fair city of Frederick and Custard Spires. So uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, travel to the Sharpsburg area in 1859 map. Now, um, this visit, and we can move on to the next uh, uh, slide, uh, was proposed by John W. Garrett, the president of the B&O Railroad. Uh, John W. Garrett is the uh, second man from uh, uh, my, my right, uh, and, uh, as you look at the picture. Uh, also in the picture, you see Mr. Lincoln, and you see uh, uh, Lord Hill Lehman is there, uh, Joseph Kennedy, uh, superintendent of the census, and then a political uh, general, uh, John McLaren from uh, uh, the state of Illinois. Now, uh, Joseph Kennedy, like President Kennedy, met a tragic ending. Lincoln invited him along because uh, uh, he wanted to pick his brain and to see how far he thought the South could hold out economically and uh, all of that. So after the Civil War, Mr. Kennedy sold his place uh, to a buyer and something uh, or, or bought a place and sometime afterward the uh, a man who sold the place returned to the house and for some reason was upset with uh, Kennedy and uh, uh, he shot and killed him. So uh, anyhow uh, uh, the trip came at the invitation of uh, John W. Garrett and Mary was very happy that uh, Ward Hill Lehman, the, his bodyguard, was uh, uh, going to come along, and uh, she thought it would be good for her aid. And we had uh, uh, political sniping back then because uh, she thought if uh, her aid could get out of Washington for a couple of days, she'd be somewhat free from. Uh, uh, the political sniping. 
So now we'll move forward um, uh, to Harpers Ferry, uh, Maryland Heights on the left, Loudon Heights on the right, and over to the left, the bustling city of Sandy Hook. And folks, believe it or not, up until the big flood of, 18, of 1939, the main road ran right through um, uh, Sandy Hook. That was uh, before my time, but Sandy Hook was the biggest uh, town in South County, South Southern Washington County at the time of the Civil War. More people in Brownsville, more people in Roarsville. Um, the main bridge, of course, had been destroyed. Dennis Fry notes that there were nine different bridges that had been destroyed at Harper's Ferry. So um, as we look at the picture, of course, Bolivar Heights uh, is in our immediate front. And uh, the train, uh, almost all of Lincoln's trips were in the utmost secrecy. Um, uh, the Secretary of the Navy went to the White House about 7.30 or 8 o'clock to see the president. Then you didn't need an appointment. You walked right in. So wonder Lincoln lasted as long as he did. And he said, well, where's the president? Well, he's gone. Well, where's he gone? Don't know. But they, uh, they talk about the commute on 270 today. Lincoln left Harper Street, uh, or D.C. at 6 a.m. and he arrived. Uh, at the base of Maryland Heights uh, at 12 noon, a nice six hour trip. And they crossed to um, um, uh, Oliver Heights on a pontoon bridge that was there at the time. So what did he do uh, on the second day of October and the uh, trip to Harpers Ferry, uh, Sharpsburg and Frederick is actually the subject of a, a little treaties on Lincoln called Four Days in October. Well, in the afternoon, uh, he uh, reviewed some troops. He met with General Sumner and General McClellan, and he had his picture taken. And just to uh, now, let's say you folks go on a trip and you call your uh, husband or your wife or your significant other to say you've arrived. He told Ward Hill Lehman and, and uh, my good friend Bob O'Connor who portrays in the first person, Ward Hill Lehman. And Lehman, uh, Bob found this in the archives. He found an old telegram that Lincoln had sent to Mary. Uh, Dear Mary, tomorrow we get our pictures taken with General Mack. Uh, he will be all right. Of course, Mack was 5'7", Lincoln being a little bit uh, six, uh, over six feet. He said, I hope I do all right and don't sway in the wind. So uh, apparently uh, he wanted to let her know. And then there's uh, various questions conne uh, connected with the uh, Maryland campaign. Where did he stay? Well, uh, in, during a Civil War centennial, I went to the main library in the area. I won't tell you where, of course it wasn't their fault. And in the pictures of the Maryland campaign, they had this gray stone building. And the note on the building, uh, Robert E. Lee and Colonel Stewart stayed here uh, during the John Brown raid in 1859, as did President Abraham Lincoln, October the 2nd, uh, or October the 1st, 1862. Well, there's only one thing wrong with that. That building was 10 years down the road, at least. It was on the campus of what is now Stewart College, one of the first African-American colleges in the United States. Uh, we feel that he probably stayed at the uh, home of the super, former superintendent of the armory. So uh, uh, you, you can't... Uh, uh, trust everything that you see. Also, I remember doing research and it had Lincoln uh, coming up the uh, Virginia side of the Potomac to Shepherdstown. Now, uh, uh, even in those days, that could not have been because Jeb, uh, Jeb Stewart and his cavalry was at the Bower, the Dandridge home uh, near Shepherdstown. 
and Confederate patrols in my side program on uh, four days in October. I was out in the, on Red Hill during the Civil War Centennial on a dirt road, and I heard hoofbeats. And I looked around, and here was this guy uh, all dressed in gray on a horse. He was a Civil War reenactor, and uh, so I took his picture. And in another program, I, I stress that, you know, Confederate patrols are on the uh, uh, west bank of the Potomac. So in the morning of April, uh, of October the 3rd, Lincoln went over to Loudoun Heights to our right and came back to Harper's Ferry, then crossed the pontoon bridge and took the road that you see at the foot of Maryland Heights uh, the Harpers Ferry Road on the Maryland side of the Potomac up to uh, uh, Harpers Ferry. So we have to be careful in our Civil War research and uh, check and double check. Okay? Now we go on to uh, one of my favorite characters. Lincoln is traveling from Harpers Ferry uh, to uh, Sharpsburg and uh, he uh, uh, comes to uh, 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 Elk Ridge, and there he visits A.S. Williams, the former postmaster of Detroit, a division commander, temporary corps commander in the 12th Corps Army of the Potomac. And uh, uh, if, if, if any of you want to really do some research on Frederick and Washington counties, in 1861, 62, and 63, you need to read from the cannon's mouth. These were the wartime letters of uh, General uh, Williams to his daughters uh, back home in Detroit. Then he tells about <clears throat> on the morning of the 3rd of October, uh, Lincoln visits the campsites of the 12th Corps walks up a logging trail and sits on a pile of logs and talks. He said he's a most homey man, homey looking man, but he's oh sincere and I believe in him. But he tells about being in Williamsport uh, and, and in Frederick County in 61. He's uh, uh, in the Maryland campaign in 62 and then in 63 uh, on the pursuit from Gettysburg. He's back in Pleasant Valley and he laments the uh, terrible destruction in Pleasant Valley of uh, the uh, crop. So uh, from the cannon's mouth by uh, uh, wartime letters of General Lee. And then we move on and we find Mr. Lincoln visiting General McClellan in a tent at Sharpsburg. Uh, the story goes that General Burnside meets Lincoln and the cavalcade at the intersection of the Mills Road and um, the uh, Harpers Ferry Road from across from uh, Harpers Ferry to Sharpsburg. And then Burnside escorted him to McClellan's headquarters. Good picture <coughs> taken by uh, um, Civil War photographer, uh, early o October 1863. Poor Burnside, you have to feel sorry for him. He met the president, and they started to McClellan's headquarters, and lo and behold, here some soldiers of the 9th New York, Hawkins the Lobs, had upset a sutler's wagon, and as they say, was clearing him out. He had either overcharged or sold inferior products, and that's how they got even. They'd upset the wagon, and then they'd help themselves. So they said uh, 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 Burnside stood up in the uh, uh, ambulance or wagon and berated the troops, and uh, suffering such embarrassment, his face turned red, said Lincoln just looked straight ahead and stroked his beard. Uh, so uh, um, that was quite an experience for poor old uh, Ambrose. So uh, then we go on to uh, McClellan's headquarters. Okay, where was it? For years, everybody thought it was at the Pry Farm, but 
Army headquarters were moved on the 20th somewhere near Sharpsburg for just one day. And then it was moved three miles south of Sharpsburg. Okay. Why study history? Never know what you're going to find. Dennis Fry and his wife bought a home, which you'll see in a moment, on the Mills Road. And while he was doing research, he found that Otho Shogun uh, had submitted a war claims or war damage claims to the U.S. government for damage claims incurred while headquarters, Army of the Potomac, and during a, pres a visit of President Abraham Lincoln. So Eureka, found at last, uh, 130, 35, maybe 140 years after the fact. The place is still there. And uh, some years ago, uh, there was a uh, radio TV station from Detroit came here. And we set up in the yard and I said that, we're coming to you live now from headquarters, Army of the Potomac on Mills Road. And so it was. So McClellan was here. Okay. Lincoln has a sad experience here. He gets up in the morning of the 3rd of October. It was a Friday morning. And he and Ozias Hatch, the Secretary of State for Illinois, take a walk. And as they walk, the uh, smoke's uh, rising as the uh, soldiers are brewing their morning coffee. And he says, Lincoln says to Hatch, Hatch, what do you see? He said, well, sir, uh, or Mr. President, I see the Army of the Potomac. And Lincoln says, rather sarcastically, no, Hatch, no, no. This is McClellan's bodyguard. So about nine o'clock, they mount up, and then about 120 people uh, proceed uh, on, down the Mills Road uh, to General Burnside's headquarters. This is was the headquarters of Ambrose Burnside for several weeks, now owned by Dennis Fry. And again, <clears throat> what a wonderful you are there place. Uh, here comes McClellan. Uh, I have the diary of a Civil War doctor, uh, James Oliver, 21st Massachusetts. He was a John Wayne type of character. And he says, here they come. Here's McClellan. He looks like a regular, a regular flop, whatever that means. F-O-P is how he spelled it. Uh, and here, uh, lined up back of this house in the field, back of Dennis's home were the regiments of the Ninth Corps, which had made the attacks on uh, um, the uh, lower bridge, the lower back bridge. And uh, Dr. Uh, Oliver writes about Lincoln. He said, here comes the president. What a comic figure. With his left hand, he's holding on to his hat, paper sticking in it. Uh, the stirrups are drawn up too tightly. And his knees are sticking up in the air, and his underwear, long johns, are showing. I don't know whether they call them long johns, but his long underwear. So that was the review uh, there in the fields. And uh, uh, most of us guides have uh, taken folks there. Dennis has been very nice, and uh, we've uh, tried to picture uh, McClellan, 120 uh, 20 officers, Mr. L uh, Lincoln uh, trooping the uh, the Lions reviewing the Ninth Corps there. Um, somewhere near there, why uh, uh, Lincoln visited some campsites of the Fifth Corps. And there was a colonel there with a lovely white horse. And at the Battle, Battle of Shepherdstown Ford, the colonel loved his white horse and he had the premonition that the white horse, that the horse would be killed. So he borrowed a black horse. And as the colonel rode into the Potomac River at Pack Horse Ford, the Confederates fired <clears throat> from the West Bank. The horse was hit and catapulted the young Lieutenant Colonel into the rivers of the Potomac. The 
black horse was dead. But Colonel Joshua Chamberlain lived to see Lincoln on October the 3rd. And uh, uh, Lincoln paused to admire the beautiful white uh, mound. And Chamberlain said that uh, he was impressed with the sincerity, but also noted how weighed down that Lincoln looked. So October the 3rd, the morning of uh, October um, 3, as I said, 1862. Okay, then uh, Mr. General McClellan gives uh, uh, Lincoln a tour of the battlefield. They proceed to uh, Bakersville, uh, uh, north of Sharpsburg, where the Sixth Corps was, and they visited the historic Dunker Church. They speed along, but anyhow, uh, Sometime during the day of October the 3rd, of course, as you know, the church blew down, was rebuilt, maybe 60% original, but the foundation was always there. And uh, on October the 3rd, Mr. Lincoln goes in through the door and visits the wounded of both sides who were there uh, in, in the church. And uh, to me, uh, this is uh, uh, an awesome spot. Uh, as uh, Chris and John know, or Matt know, you never know what kids are going to say. So one day, uh, of course, men weren't very tall back then. This little girl from California, she said, Mr. John, do you think Lincoln would have knocked his hat off coming through that door? I said, well, I think it's a good chance. But uh, Lincoln was there. You are there. And then we proceed to a place that uh, is almost uh, the holy ground to Mount Airy, west of Sharpsburg, uh, again, a question for years. Many people assumed that the pictures of Lincoln at Antietam were taken at the Fry House, but again, headquarters were moved. This was the headquarters of Fitz John Porter of the Fifth Corps. Uh, he, uh, his mother was a good friend of uh, Dr. Kerfoot, the uh, president of St. James School. And on the 21st of September, Dr. Kerfoot brought a load of food and preached at morning services. But uh, here uh, uh, on October the 3rd, Lincoln uh, again visited the wounded of both armies. Um, they, they were outside on the ground and they were in the parlor, which we will get to after a bit. And uh, uh, I had the privilege of knowing the uh, granddaughter of um, Stephen Grove, who owned Mount Airy at the time of the war, she lived to be 104 years old. And uh, uh, up until her death, she had three of the Lincoln chairs. There were four around and uh, they were sold. But the fourth one wound up in the hands of a relative a Judge Grove down in Fredericksburg. And if you'll notice, there's the chair with Mr. Lincoln having his hand on it. And folks, a chair is back in Sharpsburg in uh, possession of the town. Uh, again, what a prized possession. But General McClellan, Jonathan Letterman is there, Ward Hill, Lehman, and uh, all those people. Again, uh, the Groves uh, shared with me pictures of Stephen Grove. We moved a lot today, but uh, Stephen P. lived to be uh, 68 years of age and spent his uh, uh, entire life at Mount Airy. And they always spelled it Mount, but they didn't abbreviate it. But uh, uh, anyhow, uh, little Louisa was uh, seven years old at the time of the battle. And she left the story of how Lincoln stood in the doorway of Mount Airy and placed his hand on her shoulder or on her head and said, little girl, I'm so sorry for all the trouble this has brought to you and your family. And she said she never forgot the uh, kindness of Mr. Lincoln and uh, Louisa lived until uh, 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 1934. Um, Lincoln also went inside Mount Airy uh, to the big parlor 
where the uh, both wounded Union and Confederates were on the floor on beds of straw and blankets. Uh, the last time I was there, some 30 years ago, there were still some blood stains on the floor of the uh, uh, parlor. Lincoln was deeply moved almost to tears. And there is one story that Dr. Dahman has, the founder of the Civil War Medical Museum, that has Lincoln even uh, offering a prayer in there. And he shook hands with the wounded Confederates and said, I bear you no ill will. I hope you will recover. Uh, but then again, uh, he had bad luck with the press. So we go on to Ward Hill Layman from nearby Gerard's. Uh, he's buried in Gerard's uh, town, West Virginia. The exact opposite uh, of Lincoln, uh, a fighter uh, liked his uh, brandy a little bit. Bob, Bob O'Connor does a great job portraying him. And uh, uh, he, he saw how close Lincoln was to tears as he left. So he started to play on the banjo, pick a young butler, a sad song many years ago. And uh, the press that was almost in tears a few moments earlier came out with the big story. Lincoln tours the battlefield and makes light of the plight uh, and suffering of the wounded and dying. Lincoln said, uh, Hill, as he called Lord Hill Lehman, if I ever get a chance to tell the world what I think of this terrible war, I'll do so. Some say that this criticism hurt him the most because Mary, being from Kentucky, was called a Confederate spy in the White House. Sounds familiar, doesn't it? Uh, he was called the gorilla in the White House. And, uh, uh, but he said, uh, he, he wrote a reply, but did not answer his critics. And the opportunity to tell the world how he felt about this tragic era came 13 months later, north of here, at a place called Gettysburg. I can't prove it, and I'm glad I live just a, a mile away from Mount Airy, where I firmly believe that the Gettysburg address was conceived on the third day of October in the year of 1860. So now it's time to uh, 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 October the 4th comes and we can get ready and go one across the mountain to Frederick. Um, Lincoln will leave uh, the uh, uh, headquarters on Mills Road and at the middle bridge, a little boy by the name of Frisbee Keplinger stops and gives him a drink. And then they go to the Fry House. He visits the wounded General uh, uh, Richardson, who was struck near the tower at Bloody Lane. Supposedly, he said, I hope you will recover because I want you to take command of the army. There's only one source for that. Uh, near where the current Frederick High School now stands, a battery was drawn up. And uh, the light shower came late on the 4th of October. And as Mr. Lincoln drew near in the carriage, it fired a uh, 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 21 gun salute. He went to the Ramsey house on Record Street and visited the wounded General uh, McClell uh, uh, Hartsuff from uh, the uh, Battle of uh, Antietam. Gave a coin to a little African-American girl Walking wounded from the Presbyterian Church across the street, came across to visit Mr. Lincoln, and then it was down to uh, the B and O station. And a big crowd gathered, and this is a drawing by John Hamilton, an Englishman who came to America and uh, gave us this picture, which occurred in Harper's Weekly. Lincoln made a, a brief speech. And the uh, train pulled out and uh, went to Monocacy Junction near the Monocacy Battlefield, where uh, Matt gives excellent tours, as well as here at Antietam. And as the train drew near, uh, it slowed. I don't know whether they got a telegram or what, 
But there at Monoxy Junction, there was a new regiment coming from Michigan to Washington, marched to Monoxy Junction, and then were headed to Antietam. It was the 24th Michigan. They heard that Father Abraham was coming. They wanted to see him, and the train slowed down. And Mr. Lincoln went out on the uh, uh, back of the little caboose, waved as his troops appeared. Several years later, the survivors of the 24th Michigan and the Iron Brigade were in another on another train, the funeral train that took his body back to Springfield and to burial. So we must hurry on. We go back again to uh, uh, Fredericksburg and uh, We'll stop just briefly at Chatham, where uh, uh, Lincoln would again visit his generals. And some say that this is the only place uh, that both Lincoln and Washington were in. I don't know whether that's true, but that's one of the things that's out there. In fact, uh, Link, uh, Washington did some of his courting there. Uh, and uh, now Chatham is headquarters of the Fredericksburg, Spotsylvania uh, National Military. Okay, we move on now to the spring of 1863 after he had visited Point Lookout in December of 63. Why did he do that? Uh, 62, rather. Uh, and that was because. Uh, uh, he was considering that for the possibility of a uh, of a of a uh, prison camp. So we're down at uh, Quiet Creek Landing, a big supply base for uh, the uh, campaigns going to Richmond movement. Uh, uh, I have I don't collect many things, but I have two pieces of wood. I have a slice of wood from the Reno Oak under the tree where Reno died. And I have a slab of a railroad tie that was part of the uh, uh, train track that led from the landing further inland. But uh, in April of 63, uh, Mr. Lincoln got lost, at, lo at least lost from America. Gee, time's passing. Uh, on uh, the 5th of April, they started out to go to uh, um, the Fredericksburg area and a nor'easterner hit. Snowed to beat the band, the wind got up, the Chesapeake Bay became choppy, and then somewhere the boat carrying Lincoln pulled into a cove, and for uh, maybe 12, 15 hours, nobody knew where in the world the president was, so uh, they, there was quite an alarm. And uh, as it's, it was snow, snow on the ground on the weekend, why... Uh, uh, Joe Hooker and uh, Dan Sickle thought they'd have a ball. So they got some ladies and uh, uh, some booze and were having a time, great old time. And somebody said, hey, the president just arrived. What? And, uh, after this snowstorm? Yeah, he's coming. So they hurried the women out and cleaned up the booze and uh, got ready to welcome uh, uh, the president of the United States. Well, then somebody else had a party and they had someone uh, play the role of a, uh, an Arabic dancer. And this Arabic dancer danced around Lincoln and uh, planted a, a kiss on uh, Lincoln's cheek. Well, Lincoln never told Mary about it, but his son was there. So he squealed and uh, Mary gave Mr. Lincoln quite a unlashing. But that second week in Easter of April, 1863, saw something that the world had never seen and has never seen in America before. The pageantry and review of the military. For five days, the entire Army of the Potomac, the infantry marched, the artillery thundered by with the cannon and the caissons and the clanging sabers of the cavalry uh, passed in review one or two quarters uh, a day. And uh, 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 during this time, the uh, first corps passed in review, and lo and behold, here came a courier from the reviewing stand to Lieutenant Stewart of Battery B, 4th U.S. Artillery, 
uh, sir, Mr. Lincoln wants to see you uh, pronto. So Stuart wondered what in the world he had done. And uh, 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 his son was there and he said, Lieutenant Stuart, I will trade you my pony for your horse. And come to find out, Lincoln, I wanted to see tar old Tartar because the old Tartar was the uh, horse without a tail. Its tail had been shot off at Second Manassas and uh, he, he wanted to see this horse. Lincoln loved his horses. So uh, finally, Mr. Lincoln left him off the hook and he rode back to the uh, command. But uh, great day down at the Quiet Creek. Okay, we move on now. It's time to go to Gettysburg. Uh, on my choir landing, uh, you know, here again, all the wharves, all the boats, and uh, Lincoln would be back here uh, near the end of the war, but uh, not much there now except the uh, state marker. So uh, it's on to Gettysburg. So you folks who uh, uh, live in the Walkersville area, uh, do you know, and I didn't even though I studied history until I was in college, that 80% of the Union Army marched within uh, a couple of miles of Walkersville on the way to Gettysburg. The first Corps on the Emmitsburg Pike, the 11th Corps on the Old Frederick Road through Graceham, uh, right through Walkersville, the uh, third and the 11th Corps, where uh, the third Corps camped on June the 28th on the farm that is now discovered. And the 12th Corps in Meade went by uh, 194, and the 5th Corps and the 2nd Corps went Route 26 and then cut across the country. But this is where Mr. Lincoln came on the, uh, 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 in, in November of 1863 for his uh, famous address. Uh, we we uh, are all sort of familiar with that. Uh, we can move on to the church and uh, just a few words about the uh, speech. An autumn afternoon, mid-November, throngs of people, music, a parade, dirges, prayers, a long oration. Then a tall, thin man speaking from deep within, a few appropriate marks, only two, 275 one words, Mr. Lincoln, Gettysburg. November 19th, 1863, those who were there had seen and heard history being made. Lincoln paused to uh, visit the uh, Presbyterian Church to hear a speech. He met old John Barnes, Burns, a, uh, war, uh, war, a veteran of, of uh, the War of 1812. And then he got on the train and he wasn't feeling well. Wasn't bad water this time but he had a small dose of, paw, of smallpox. And on the way back to Washington, he laid down in the one car and he said, well, with his humor, he said, well, now at least I have a, a, something that I can give a little bit of something to everybody. So I don't know how many of them, it wasn't COVID, but I don't know how many of them got the smallpox. So um, we must hurry on. We go back to City Point and uh, in the spring of 1865, the war was drawing to a close, and uh, uh, General Grant, Grant and Lincoln got along real well, uh, said to Robert Lincoln, who was on his staff, he said, uh, I wonder if your mother and father would consider a visit to City Point, the war is drawing to a close. Robert said, well, I'll check and see. So the invitation was uh, uh, issued, and so Lincoln was going to come on a small ship, but lo and behold, he couldn't get away from Mary. Mary wanted to go along, so they had to get the River Queen, a bigger boat. So they came down to a quiet creek, and two of the last three weeks of his life was spent at City Point uh, down near Petersburg as Grant was completing the siege there. Um, so we can move on to the next one. Uh, great supply depot, ships, wharves, bakeries, hospitals, you name it, it was uh, uh, all, all there. So uh, uh, anyhow, uh, Lincoln conferred with Grant, Sherman, and Sheridan, said let them up easy. Every day he walked up over to the uh, uh, telegraph office to see uh, uh, what was happening. Uh, uh, 
from on the far flung battlefields and uh, to show you his compassion why uh, uh, he uh, saw some stray kittens and he went and got some milk and gave the stray kittens and he told somebody in the quartermaster you should you be sure now to see that these kittens get milk every day so that's the kind of man he was uh, uh, a great man okay we move on and uh, we have a picture of uh, General Grant and his son, Jesse. And uh, uh, believe it or not, uh, those of you, Frederick Round Table, back in the winter of 1960, 1961, the Maryland Centennial Commission had its uh, kickoff dinner, full house at the uh, William B. Talley Armory. And the guest speaker was uh, U.S. Grant the third. So, uh, uh, again, uh, U.S. Grant III, and, and Grant went to the Frederick Fair uh, uh, while he was president. Uh, so we move on. Another picture coming up from uh, um, City Point, Mrs. Ord. Okay, poor Lincoln. All his critics, and like Billy Graham, he said, if I answered all my critics, I wouldn't get anything done. But uh, uh, Mary was alone. And Mary threw a couple of fits, pardon the expression, uh, because uh, Mrs. Ord, Mrs. Grant, and General Griffin's wife all got too close to her aid. And she was a very jealous woman, and she flew into a rage and embarrassed them and raked them over the coals. And for the rest of the trip, these three ladies pretty much... Uh, uh, avoided Mrs. Lincoln. Uh, Abe was uh, berated him in front of General Meade. Meade turned and looked her away, but uh, must have been a terrible, a terrible scene, man. I tell you, CNN and all these stations would have a ball with it today. And uh, uh, it, it was uh, just, just r r r real bad. Uh, so uh, anyhow, uh, when they got ready to leave, oh well. Uh, Mary accused Mrs. Grant of wanting to get her. Uh, he said, yeah, I know why you're, uh, why, what, what you're aiming to do. You, you, you want your husband to take my husband's place. Well, Lincoln, well, back then, I guess you could have run for him for another term, but, but anyhow. Well, so uh, um, anyhow, uh, that threw a lot of cold water on the events at uh, City Point. Okay, we move on. April the 2nd, the courier walks into St. Paul's Church, walks up to where General Lee is, so the enemy is broken through. It was April the 2nd, our lines have been broken, and uh, uh, we have to uh, retreat. So, uh, anyhow, Lincoln uh, comes into Richmond, walks among the ruins after the fire. The Africans, American flock to him. They kneel down, want to kiss his hand. They call him Massa Lincoln, Massa Lincoln and all of that. And he said, you know, uh, don't bow to me. I'm just an instrument uh, in uh, his hands. And then on April, well, and then, of course, he had his two bad dreams while he was there. Uh, the one, there's a ship sailing out over the ocean. And Lincoln said he's had this dream before every major event in his life. Then you know that other dream, he walks into the East Room of the White House and people are crying and there's a corpse lying there. And he said, what's wrong? And they say, the president is dead. An omen, who knows? Uh, but there were some happy moments as he and Mary were able to walk in the woods and hold hands and all of that. But on April the 8th, uh, he says, I wanna visit the hospitals before I go. And some have said that on that day, Lincoln shook hands with over 5,000 wounded. He said, I want to shake hands with those who made this victory possible. Such a great call. Uh, call. 5,000 hands. He said when he was done, his hand was shaking, but someone came up to him and said, Mr. Lincoln, could, how long do you think you could hold this ax out straight? And I don't remember how long it was, but uh, despite his hand having shook from shaking hands with the wounded, he held the ax out for quite a while. So 
So uh, that night then, uh, it's time, it's April the 8th, time to go back to Washington. Mrs. Lincoln, who was on the River Queen, and Mrs. Grant, who was on the Mary Martin, both decide to have a party. And uh, uh, on the, as the Grant boat passes the Lincoln boat, Mrs. Grant has the band to play the loudest march they can find, <laughs> the sort of so cold war on Mrs. Lincoln's party. That's the revenge there. And so the ships sail out. Well, we go on now and we come back momentarily to the Pry House. And we are fortunate that we have these places here in Harpers Ferry, in the Antietam Valley, Sharpsburg and Frederick, connected with the life of the great emancipator. Sort of a sad story and yet a poignant story. People drive by the entrance there and maybe wonder what's, uh, what it's all about. Many years ago, I interviewed the great niece of the prize. They were ruined by the army being there and they had to move to Tennessee. And Hazel Pry Marino shared the story that they packed their baggage and headed for Tennessee. And somewhere near the Tennessee border, there was another moving van accident with the wagon upset and the lock on the trunk sprang open and some of the important papers flew out. Hazel declares that she had seen it earlier and that it was a thank you note from Mrs. Pry, uh, uh, from Mr. Lincoln to Mrs. Pry uh, for giving her, for giving him some food on Saturday morning, the 4th uh, of October on his way back to uh, uh, Washington. One last slide, I'm sorry I've gone so long. Uh, uh, I get long-winded, I'm sorry about that. But uh, it's late at night on April the 8th, and Mr. Lincoln stands on the deck of the River Queen with a French noble, nobleman by the name of Chambrin. And uh, Lincoln liked music, and uh, he appropriated Dixie as his own song. And twice on the road back, during the night hours, he had the La Marseillaise and Dixie played. And uh, uh, he uh, stood there on the deck with Chambrin and he quoted from Shakespeare. Again, did he know something? It was Palm Sunday, April the 9th. And uh, he quoted these words, Duncan is in his grave after his fitful fever his sleep he sleeps. Duncan is in his grave. After life's fitful fever, he sleeps. It took a while to get to Washington. And as they neared Washington, D.C. on the evening of April the 9th, they saw fireworks. Church bells were ringing. Bonfires were lighted. People were in the street cheering. What's going on? No telegraph, no red phone on the River Queen. They said, well, Mr. Lincoln, the war is over. Lee surrendered today at Appomattox. The war was over. And Lincoln's wartime travels, as well as his life, were almost over. Because in five days, he had a rendezvous with death a place called Ford's Theater. And not only were his travels, but his life was over. Thank you for being patient. Questions? Well, first off, John, thank you for uh, that fantastic rundown. I know that was just the tip of the iceberg for the amount of information that you have in regards to Lincoln's wartime travels. And I do encourage people to check out his new book, Lincoln's Wartime Tours from Washington, D.C. by Arcadia Press. So for those of you looking for a good bit of Lincoln, uh, definitely check that one out. John, how is it looking for uh, questions? Do we have a few? Uh, well, we have a number of, uh, well, one question and a number of comments in the comments section. Um, 
Sandy uh, tuning in from Baltimore, very interested in this topic as uh, their ancestor was present at Lincoln's visit to the peninsula and post Antietam. So that's neat. Hmm. Um, we have uh, Mark watching from England, which is very exciting. Wow. Absolutely. Um, Kim watching from Tennessee, David watching wow. from Maine. So we got people from uh, far outside Frederick County tuning in, which is uh, always neat. Um, did have a question from Ken. Uh, he said, I had a guide tell me that Lincoln hiked up Maryland Heights, but gave up halfway as too strenuous. Is this true? Uh, the, the, uh, he, he started up uh, part way and he did stop. I don't think it was too strenuous, but there was the time factor. He was already running late. In fact, the uh, first corps had been drawn up for review and he never made it for the review as it was. So uh, I think it was time factor, but he did start up. That, that's, that's right. Um, uh, with the, uh, to the 12th Corps camps and part the way up, he, he sat and talked with General Williams. So uh, uh, he's correct, but I, I, I think Mr. Lincoln was in uh, excellent physical shape. <laughs> Uh, that's the, the only question in the comment section. If anyone has any questions, now's the time to uh, tune in and ask. Um, I, I actually had a question that uh, occurred to me while you were talking. How like public was the knowledge of Lincoln's travels? I mean, obviously, you know, someone like McClellan would know to expect Lincoln, but how far down the chain of command would you go for it to just be a surprise to have him show up? Uh, Good question. Uh, apparently, too well known, uh, when he came to uh, Sharpsburg, they had about four or five hours to get a tent up for him. So, you know, the high command knew, but I'm, I'm not sure how far down the chain of command that, that others knew. And uh, in terms of leaving Washington, he, the cabinet and everybody was uh, pretty much left in the dark. John, you've got a wide range of tales about Lincoln and his travels that you've worked on for a long time. Um, where did or how were you able to piece together these stories? Some of them, of course, Lincoln visiting Antietam was fairly well known, but some of those little anecdotes and things that you were able to uh, relay to us, I'm curious how you were able to piece those together over the years. Well, the uh, first, the Antietam story is... Um, Judge Delaplane of Frederick wrote a little article way back when about Lincoln. So there were things about uh, from Antietam. Plus some of the old timers at Sharpsburg gave me things. Uh, John Hennessy, the uh, superintendent at Fredericksburg, uh, mm -hmm. had compiled a lot of material on the uh, reviews at Acquire Creek and graciously shared them with me. Uh, his research and his research notes, which you know, I really, and, and then there was a guy by the name of Noah Brooks, who was a newspaper editor and uh, uh, wrote back to his paper every day about what was happening. At, and then uh, a guy by the name of Fonts uh, really covered in one book the last two weeks at City Point. So to a degree, the research, uh, uh, and then I, I found some old Civil War newspapers, and, uh, but others, I'd done, done some of the plowing of the ground, you know, ahead of me, which is very, very helpful. Uh, we've got another couple questions coming in here. Uh, this one from Sandy. Uh, when Lincoln visited Bakersville in the Sixth Corps, do you know if he visited any homes or the church there? Uh, to my knowledge, yes. He visited the church in the uh, uh, one or two places right next to it. And... Uh, there was some New York cavalry station there. He talked with them, and uh, I assume it was basically right in the area where the uh, a church and there's one or two homes located. The uh, 6th Corps was there to protect against the uh, crossing of the Potomac. Uh, Mark uh, from England uh, asked, uh, what sort of security measures were in place for Lincoln's tours? Uh, what kind of security? Uh, Basically, Ward Hill Lehman. Uh, he was about six feet. He, he would have been a good pro football player. He called, uh, carried a couple of uh, 
uh, pistols, a derringer, and some knives, and uh, basically that was it. And uh, Lehman uh, uh, lamented until his dying day that uh, he was not on duty at Ford's Theater, but uh, he was the Marshal District of Columbia. And uh, well, as you know, at Ford's Theater, they just hired almost nobody. And uh, security getting into the White House was easy. And uh, so uh, with the exception of, of, of Lehman, uh, wasn't much more. Uh, and there is a uh, a movie out, a dramatization about uh, Layman's work. Uh, is it called Saving Lincoln or something like that? Something like that. I've heard kind of mixed yeah. reviews, but it's it's uh, mostly focused on Layman. Yeah, I, it's it's pretty interesting. I saw the the filmography is fascinating. They, they're acting in front of actual Civil War photography. Hmm. Um, it's 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 worth watching just to kind of see how they do that, which is pretty neat. Uh, I'm no expert on Lehman, but I think the movie was, you know. Fun. And, and also uh, his writings uh, were crucial to uh, Antietam. You know, he tells the story at the Grove Farm and uh, Bob O'Connor, uh, I got to know him and uh, I knew uh, Lehman's papers are at the Stanford University Library and uh, he went out and gosh, Bob, I don't know how many books. And if you haven't had Bob and Frederick, uh, he'd be a great one to have. He even reaches into his pocket and pulls out his little flask and takes a drink. But this first person in the state of Virginia, West Virginia has uh, given him a grant. He goes uh, all across the state to various schools and talks about Lincoln and Lehman and uh, that relationship. And he's in Charlestown. Uh, West Virginia. Uh, he'd be great to have. Excellent. Absolutely. Uh, that's all I'm seeing from the comments right now. Well, John, again, thank you very much for being able to connect with us this evening, telling some great uh, Lincoln and his travel stories. Um, John from the Medical Museum, thank you uh, once more for hosting us this evening. I think we're going to leave it at that. Just to let everybody know, for next month, we do have Joel Hummel, who will be speaking on the Bureau of Military Information. So please check that mm -hmm. out. Or come on back and check that one out as well. It's going to be a good conversation. Thank but you, once Matt, again, ladies John. and gentlemen, thank you very much uh, to John Schultz for a wonderful presentation this evening. And I hope everyone has a wonderful night. All righty. See you, everyone. Hello, thank you.